Welcome to the United Kingdom, Jim. Thank you, thank you. Have a look at your tongue. Can I have a look at yours? <laughs> <laughs> Tit for tat. Tongue for tongue. You're the new man in the band. Yes, I am. Pretty difficult type of person to play. Well, um, I don't think I was here to replace Peter as, you know, as such. Peter wanted to do his own thing. You know, he wanted to uh, put his own album out. He wanted to be with his wife. And he just didn't want to tour anymore. So the group decided, you know, to get another drummer. And uh, I'm just there to do the best I can. Uh, I designed, you know, my character and everything. And I'm just out here and I'm the fox. And that's it. And he's the cutest one so far. Yes, I am. But I'm, I'm told that virtually everything that you're traveling with, which includes a road crew of something like 50 people, you right. brought from the United States to Europe. Yes. Yes, we may go for a statehood here. We brought basically the same crew that we use in the States on our tours. The stage is a slight bit smaller because most of the halls here really can't accommodate the American Kiss show, but basically it's the, it's the same show. And we, we've uh, wanted to come back here for a long time. We're obviously here for the people that want to see us. There is a heavy following for you in this country who call themselves, as they do in the States, the Kiss Army. Yeah, yeah. You know, the nice thing about KISS, I guess, is that our fans tend to be really rabid, so to speak. You know, we don't have the kind of fans that go, oh, KISS is okay. We don't need those kind of fans. If you don't love us, then leave us. Ace, when it comes to the spectacular side of the show, do you not find it pretty hard work? No, I am the spectacular part of the show. <laughs> 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 but, uh, you, know, you know, I make guitars fly, explode, go on fire, smoke. Give birth, <laughs> birth to new guitars. You know, look at baby guitars. <laughs> But uh, it's an interesting show. I, th I think you'll find it quite accommodating. <laughs> Your audience in America is a very young audience. And it also goes up into the high age bracket. What sort of an audience do you like think you have? Grandpas and grandmas. I think there'll be a wide variety of ages from uh, probably five to 50. I know a nine year old girl in Los Angeles who's crazy about you. Right. She's been to see you umpteen times. Well, the cool thing about Kiss is that. You know, we relate, people relate to us on all different levels. You know, some people are really into the way we look. I think the younger kids really don't, aren't really aware of us as a, a musical group. They're more aware of us as almost superheroes. And the, the older kids, I think, are into us because of what we are. I mean, we're a rock and roll band. So we're here, we're not here to uh, juggle, we're here to play. We've already recorded two tracks for the upcoming album, and it's going to be a much, much heavier album more reminiscent of our alive album. This one's called Talk to Me! After Europe, we went to Australia. At that point, we were the biggest thing the Australians had ever seen. One in every 14 people in that country had bought a KISS record. We played multiple dates in soccer stadiums when nobody else had ever played stadiums there. The first band to ever play stadiums anywhere in the world was the Beatles at Shea Stadium. People don't realize that before then, bands just didn't get to be that big. But when we played Down Under, we were on the cover of every newspaper. On one cover, the headline even said, Kiss Boots. This was the most trivial story imaginable. We had sent out our platform heels to get fixed at a boot store. Well, somehow, the proprietor wound up being on the cover of the newspaper. There were terrorist attacks and wars being fought. But on the cover, there was nothing but the band. Kiss Army Invades Australia. We couldn't go anywhere. We were trapped at the top floor of our hotel. Helicopters with zoom lenses were trying to get photos of us without makeup because there was a price on our heads. America had gone nuts for KISS in 74. Japan had taken it to the next level in 77. But Australia in 1981 
was like nothing we had ever seen. Anything we wanted was ours. Hello, Australia. This is Gene Simmons of Kiss, and I'd like to introduce you to... Paul Stanley of Kiss, who wants to introduce you to Ace Bailey of Kiss. What's the name of the new drummer? All right. I think his name is, uh... Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, his name is, uh... Ah, uh, ah, uh, 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 Oh, wait a minute. I remember. I remember. His name is Eric Carr, and he's incredible. Okay. Now get out of here. Take 456. Kiss are today's rock and roll legends, the most sensational teenage phenomenon of the past decade. They're really good, they're top. Who's your favourite in the group? Paul Stanley. Gene Simmons! The American rock and roll phenomenon that is Kiss, and you better believe they're no ordinary band. They have put the fiery rebellion of rock back into today's teenagers. Kids have waited out all week just to get kissed. We want Kiss! We want Kiss! Just prior to the group's appearance, an estimated 2,000 people were waiting below. My appeal today is to the young at heart, as well as the young. A happy day in the lawful pursuit of happiness. The kids' group. How you doing, Australia? You know, you know we've been waiting a long time to come and see you, and we love you! To further confuse their critics, the band that shocked the virginal heroes of yesteryear off the best-selling lists often take time off to visit children in hospital who cannot come and see the band perform. Immediately after their appearance, they were rushed back to their hotel for their one and only meeting with Australia's press. Uh, basically, what does KISS stand for? What are all those rumors about satanic influences? Kiss doesn't stand for anything. Uh, we're uh, a rock and roll band. Crazy, 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 crazy. You see, when I was born, the doctor made a mistake and he grabbed wrong with the wrong appendage and he pulled. Oh. I mean, will you still be doing what you're doing at the age of 40? Well, who knows? What will you be doing at the age of 40? Band has never sounded tighter. Uh, I think I fit in really well with the guys. And, you know, if you come to the show, you'll hear it. We're just four fun-loving Americans who like to play rock and roll and have a good time. The effect of all this hysteria was that we couldn't go anywhere. This might have been torture, but the Australian promoter, bless him, rented out entire clubs and filled them with girls. They were the top-notch models in the country, and they kept us busy. At these parties, Ace would get blitzed. An Aussie press man became one of Ace's drinking buddies, and at one of the parties, while everyone was sitting around talking, Ace and the gentleman started making out. I don't really believe that Ace pitched for the other team, but it wouldn't matter if he did. It was clear, however, after he got enough alcohol into his system, all bets were off. He would lose his inhibitions and think nothing of kissing and making out with men. Ace and Peter would think nothing of kissing each other. I think this was an infatuation on both their parts, with the godfather culture that had become very popular with them, a sort of a we-know-the-right-people attitude, proof that they shared a bond. With Peter being Italian and Ace always threatening to call the right people to do his dirty work if he wasn't treated well. During one of those lavish private parties on the Australian tour, Eric became fascinated by one girl in the club. He was wearing a camouflage outfit again, and everyone else was dressed for nightlife. The guys in leather jackets and frilly shirts, and the girls in very little. Except for this one girl, who looked like a female version of Eric, in a woman's camouflage outfit. She was very beautiful, and very shapely. But Eric didn't want to go over, so I arranged for the girl to come over and talk to him. And the two of them really hit it off. He was in the process of convincing her to come back to the hotel, and she kind of laughed and said, Look, I can't go back with you. I'm married. Eric backed off immediately. I was amazed. What's the problem, I said. If you want her to come, just invite her, and then it's up to her. Whether she's married or not, it's her choice. So he told her where we were going to be next, Melbourne, I think. And wouldn't you know it, she decided to come to see him. She got on a plane and flew to meet us. 
Most guys would have been thrilled, but Eric was so nervous that by the end of the day, he had horrible gas pains. He had to go to the bathroom every five minutes, and it wasn't the kind of gas you could get rid of silently. They were all of the 1812 Overture variety. Needless to say, the girl didn't hang out for long. It was always like that with Eric. Something would always happen to him. On another tour a few years later, when we were on the road in America touring for Creatures of the Night, Eric wrote a long letter in response to a girl who had written him. Eric was always very emotional, and it wasn't unusual for him to reply to a fan letter with a five- or ten-page handwritten answer. After he replied to one letter, he ended up having something of a friendship with this girl from Phoenix. When we got to Phoenix on the tour, Eric told me about the girl. He couldn't wait to see her. After our sound check, Eric left, and I noticed a stunning girl in a red dress standing at the back of the empty hall. She had on makeup, perfume, the whole thing. As was my custom, I brought her into my office, which was the backstage bathroom, and threw her on the floor. We had an exchange, shall we say. We became very close friends in a number of positions, and there was a photo session afterward. There always was. Then she happily left. Later that evening, as we were putting on our makeup, I told Eric about my liaison. He wasn't really listening. He was still preoccupied with his Phoenix girl. So we started talking about that, and I happened to ask him how he would know her, since they had never met. Well, he said, she told me she'd be wearing a red dress. As he was telling me what she looked like, the horror of it dawned on me. I showed him the photos from the afternoon's meet and greet and asked, Is this her? Well, he was devastated. I apologized. I told him I didn't know, and that wasn't even the end of it. That night, back at the hotel, the two of them met, and he was very upset with her. They fought, and he threw her out. And she came down the hall for a second visit with me. I didn't want Eric to be upset with me, not over this or over anything else. I tried to give him the lay of the land and told him that he couldn't take any of this seriously. For me, it was about fun and games. If you go to a beauty pageant and there are four girls there, do you really care who you wind up with? But since it was all so new to him, it really affected him. The unmasked tour had been a turbulent one for the band. Diana had decided to fly over so we could spend some time together during the first part of the tour when we were in London. It became very difficult even to go to a restaurant. There were paparazzi constantly prowling around, trying to get photos of us together and me without my makeup. To make matters worse, the band and Bill Coyne had a meeting and decided to confront me about going Hollywood. They said, and rightfully so, that because my relationship with Diana and before that with Cher was so public, it changed the fans' perspective of Kiss. We'd always been outsiders who never fraternized with other celebrities, and now there I was actually having relationships with these women. It just wasn't rock and roll, I was told. All this inner turmoil in the band wasn't helping Ace's mental well-being. A coin no longer seemed to have the spark of leadership. Eric was simply happy to be in there and hardly ever voiced an opinion. I was not the favorite guy in the band at the time. After the tour, we retreated to our separate homes and spent time away from each other. I came back to New York to a new dynamic that would unfold before my eyes. In Australia, I began to seriously question Bill O'Coin. 
His cocaine use had become more extreme, and since splitting up with Sean Delaney, his general behavior had become reckless, too. One morning, I went to his room and found a boy in his early teens eating a bowl of cereal in Bill's bed. Another morning, I found a different boy there. Bill was out of control. When we got back to the States, a boy who had won a contest had been flown in to meet us, along with a photographer from the magazine that had sponsored the contest. Bill was clearly hitting on the kid. The next day I said, Bill, tell me you didn't. Yes, I did. And the photographer. Bill had crossed a line into an area I saw as criminal and immoral. I was no longer laughing. One of the best tours uh, that we ever had, I believe, was the first time to Australia. That was in the beginning of the 80s. Uh, we had a number of things that made it certainly great. We had our own plane, our nine limousines, our own helicopter, as well as uh, some terrific parties. The Australians are a lot of fun to be with. In fact, the parties were so great that uh, we drank all the Dom Perignon that was in Australia. All the champagne in Australia, certainly the Dom Perignon, especially because Ace liked that. We used to load the planes up and have them at every party. In fact, the nights that we didn't have parties, which were few and far between, uh, we'd open Bill's Bar. Bill's Bar became a, a special event when there weren't any other parties. We'd all feel like we'd have to continue because, after all, once in a party mood, always in a party mood. So I would, I would open Bill's Bar any time there wasn't a party, and I would be the bartender. And then we'd invite people from the hotel or fans that we met along the way all to come and join us at the hotel on the opening of Bill's Bar. The shows in Australia were, were the biggest that uh, had ever been brought to Australia. We were playing stadiums with, a, with a, one of the largest KISS shows. The press used to follow us around every day in Australia. We were in the front of the newspapers. Uh, there were major events the, when we first arrived in Sydney uh, with the mayor giving us the key to the city. Uh, we had, we had uh, television stations and, and radio stations as well as the top reporters who actually flew with us all around Australia. And there was also some controversy. There was a reverend who had talked about Kiss being uh, the Knights of Satan service, which followed us around every once in a while, and had uh, made a big statement in, in the national newspaper about Kiss being evil. So we decided to show them that we certainly weren't evil, and that was never really the case. We decided to dress up and go and visit the children's hospital the next day. And that was a terrific day. I mean, the kids loved it, so I think we finally put that to rest. We had a promotion guy who was with a record company, and he was a little bit of a nerd. I mean, he just he had to have his way about everything and kept bugging us about everything and everything else. And So afterwards, I said, you know, we need, we need to relax, and let's make sure we keep the pool at the hotel open late. So you arrange for that. So, oh, all right, all right, all right, all right. And, and, of course, and, of course, he felt that, you know, there'll be, there'll be women there, there'll be partying, it'll be great, we'll have the pool open late, and so forth. So we were pretty tired of this guy. And uh, Paul decides, well, I'll think of something. And uh, the guy, we're back at the pool. The guy hasn't come up yet. He's downstairs at the bar having a drink. And um, Paul takes a poop in the pool, the old poop in the pool trick. In any case, uh, it, the poop is lying at the bottom of the pool. And the guy comes in, the promotion guy from the record label. And Paul goes up to him and says, you know, he says, I can't believe it. I just dropped my watch in the pool. And now this guy, whose ego is bigger than all the group together, says, don't worry, Paul. So he dives to the bottom of the pool, and of course, what he got was a handful of poop. One of the parties we threw in Australia was a, a big gathering in Sydney, and Elton John was in town doing a tour. So we invited Elton to come and join us and so forth. Well, I have to tell you, Elton was having a party the next night. But we were so rowdy the first night, he told the record company after the party, make sure you don't invite those KISS guys to my party. 
Gene Simmons. Well, there's a one of a kind. Gene was really the driving force behind KISS, uh, keeping at it uh, day and night uh, ever since I met him back in 73. One of the things Gene had a problem with, though, was doing interviews for KISS. He always sounded like a school teacher to us, and all of us kind of got after him over and over again. He's a rock star. He had to talk like a rock star. Well, he really couldn't ever get that through his head in the earlier days, so Paul, Peter, and Ace kind of ganged up on him and said, look it, if you're going to talk like a school teacher, we're then going to do the interview. So you can make a few sounds and grunts and groans, and every once in a while say something short, Gene. Remember, short, Gene, but we're going to be the rock and rollers and we'll talk for you. So, so ever since that moment in time, Gene has always been pretty much the quiet one, certainly in rock and roll interviews. Paul Stanley. Well, Paul, Paul is the musical backbone of the group, and he really is. Um, probably more of a writer, producer, and obviously, you know, he's the singer. Uh, he's, uh, there were many things that have happened uh, with Paul. Uh, when I first met Paul, Paul was a little overweight. And I know you don't think of Paul like that today because he's always taking good care of himself. But he was a little overweight, a little chubby. And uh, when we went on the first road tour back in 74, he got sick in Atlanta, and he got the flu, and it lasted for a few days. And he lost about 10 pounds. I'll never forget this. He, and he called me, and he said, Bill, I really look good now. He said, I'm never going to put that weight on again. And he never did. He really kept himself in great shape. The one thing I never could understand about Paul is uh, every time we went to Los Angeles, he would lose his voice. And I suspect it was probably the stress. You know, you know you're going to Los Angeles, you're going to be playing for thousands and thousands of people, including lots of celebrities and everything else. But we always used to lose Paul's voice. Somewhere in Los Angeles it used to go, and uh, what we used to have to do is have a, a throat specialist come, and we used to freeze his vocal cords before the show because he used to get laryngitis. And uh, before, before every show, we would freeze his vocal cords, and it would last for about half hour, 45 minutes, and he would come off the stage and would have to do it again so he could get through the show. I remember one time when we were touring Australia and New Zealand, we had gotten to New Zealand, and Paul was going out with a famous actress from Hollywood who was shooting a movie on the other side of the island, New Zealand, quite a few hours away. And he came in to me one night and he said, uh, you know, I really would like to see her, Bill. We have a couple of days and, and uh, what do you think I should do? How do you think I can see her? I said, well, you know, I, I guess you could rent a jet. And uh, we thought it back and forth and talked about it for a bit. And Paul finally decided he'd rent a jet and he'd fly down to see her. Well, when Paul went to see her, he wanted to make a big entrance. So what he did is he asked the pilot of the jet to fly over the shooting area where they were shooting the movie. So he buzzed her a couple of times and everything, and then they went and landed the jet. What he didn't know further was that they had to stop all shooting, and the director was absolutely beside himself. This kind of this nut that was flying around over their heads while they were trying to shoot a movie. They had to stop shooting it that afternoon, and of course, the actress found out it was Paul coming to see her to spend an evening. You know, I just remembered a story. I know that when I used to go up to their rooms in a hotel, I never knew quite what was going to happen to me when I walked through the door, whether I was going to step in a bucket of water or whether a bucket was going to fall on my head and I'd be soaked. And Paul was famous for this. You never really knew. Ace Fraley. Ace Fraley is truly an original. Uh, sweetheart, uh, probably would take the shirt off his back for you. A kidder and an all-around fun guy to be around. Ace, I'll tell you one story that Ace, Ace played on uh, Gene and Paul. I think it was in Kansas City. I'm not quite sure. But in any case, I get a call from Gene and Paul on the road, and I'm in New York. And they tell me that Ace had been drinking, and he, he's just so out of his mind that he won't be able to do the show that night. And they're very upset. Oh, my God, what are we going to do about the fans, the promoter, the this, the that? You're going to have to come right out. So I go to the airport. I get on a plane. I arrive, and Gene and Paul are waiting for me, and they're telling me these horror stories about Ace. Oh, my goodness, we had to carry him into the hotel. He won't be able to stand up. Never mind about playing the show. We'll never do it. I said, okay, let me go and see what's happening, and I asked the road manager where he was. He's up in his room. Okay. So I go up to the room. I knock on the door. I say, Acefer. I always used to call him Acefer, so. And he said, oh, Bill, come on in. So I go in, and Ace is sitting at a table reading a book. 
having a beer. Now, I know something's wrong, because if he's really out of his mind, he'd be laying down out of it someplace. So uh, I say, hi, Ace, what's happening? You know, oh, oh, oh well, I, I just kind of getting, you know, Gene and Paul. I mean, you know, it's about time I could play a trick on them. So anyway, so we go through this whole thing, and I realize he's done them in. He's been, he's been fooling them all day long, the road crew. He's talked the road crew into having to carry him into the hotel, and, you know, he's, he's done this up just right. So they're really upset. I'm all the way out there from New York. So Ace and I decide, okay, we'll carry this through just a little bit longer. In any case, we tell the, the road manager to tell Gene and Paul, don't worry, we'll somehow get Ace there. We don't know how. We'll stand him up and get him to the sound check. Don't worry about it. You go to the sound check. Somehow we'll get Ace there. Meanwhile, Ace and I get it together, sneak out of the back door of the hotel, and go to the sound check, get all his amps set up properly. And by the time Gene and Paul gets there, they're already, he's already playing and, and out on stage and rehearsing the material. So they finally knew they'd finally been had. And, uh, but that was Ace. Ace was just a practical joker and always lots of fun. Another story that Ace, and Ace has many of them, but one other I can think of is the time in Stockholm. When the promoter decided that it was a night out, he should take us out to dinner, and there was a unique club. And in this particular restaurant club, they had a pool in the middle of it. And everyone that sat around the tables around the pool had a little remote control unit, and you could have your own little shrimp boat that would come out of the kitchen, and you'd guide it to your table full of fresh shrimp, and you'd eat it. Then you'd send your boat back to the kitchen, it'd fill it up with shrimp again, and you'd bring it to your table. Well, the promoter thought we should all loosen up a bit, and he introduced us to a drink called Jägermeister's. Well, the Jägermeister was not popular at that time, certainly not in the States, and we had no idea what it was. Oh, the promoter did. He thought it would loosen everyone up and everyone would have a great time. Well, it certainly did loosen us up. Uh, by the time we finished, Ace was walking around the pool, picking up the radio control boats, and hand-delivering the shrimp to everyone's table. Well, the, the owner of the club was a little crazy. He thought Ace would be falling through the pool, which was made of fiberglass, and about three feet off the ground. So he saw Ace and his feet going through the bottom of the pool and wrecking his pool. But we finally got Ace out of the pool and back to the hotel, and we had one raucous night. Uh, let's see if we can think of one more Ace story I can tell you. Oh, yes, there's one when I was heading up to Ace's house in Connecticut. And Ace had just finished this underground studio, and we would do demos there, of new songs and so forth. We called it Ace's Bunker. And we'd go down up to Ace. You never really quite knew what was going to happen. And one day I'm driving up going down Ace's driveway, and I get buzzed by a helicopter. It was a pretty good-sized helicopter. I mean, it, was, it would really shook me up because I didn't quite understand what was happening. And Ace used to have these radio control helicopters. And he'd come down his driveway, and he'd hide behind the house or in a bush someplace, and he would buzz your car as you came down his driveway. Well, you never knew what you were going to have when you met Ace or when you were at his house, but it was always fun. Peter Chris. Well, Peter Chris is a true rock and roller. If there was ever a rock and roller, someone meant to be, Peter certainly has been there. Done everything and certainly had his ups and downs in life, but is truly uh, the ultimateness in what you'd feel as a rock and roller. Uh, Peter, Peter could also be very emotional, uh, very sensitive, very emotional. You could say something to Peter who'd, that would either be very up or very down, depending on how he took it that day. And, uh, but there were a lot of things that would happen. Uh, because he was so emotional, sometimes he would, uh, he would do things to, to get attention, but uh, sometimes he would hit his hand on something because he, you'd say, oh my goodness, you're the drummer, Peter. Why did you do that? Well, you know, I'm not sure today. I really can do this today. And uh, he'd go through some heavy emotions. But he would, also be, he would also be a wild one. I remember one great party that Peter threw in his house up in Connecticut. And uh, when we were all kind of, we had great food and uh, lots of people were there. And it was just one of the best parties we had had. And all of a sudden, Ace comes to me and says, I think Peter is shooting his gun. And I said, you know, what's that sound? Is that, he said, oh, I think Peter's shooting his gun. And I said, oh, no, 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 we're in the house. Well, sure enough, Peter comes downstairs, and as he's coming down the stairs, he's shooting his gun into the ceiling. When you can imagine people jumping over chairs, jumping behind couches, running into the kitchen, running out of the house. And, uh, well, that was just one party. There was many others that were even wilder. Uh, Peter, always the, always the crazy rock and roller. I can remember this story while we were in Germany. I think it was Frankfurt. But 
Anyway, we were in Germany, and, and one night late, about 2 in the morning, I get a call from the road manager. Have you seen Peter? I said, no. Is he in his room? No. Well, he must have left the hotel. No, he didn't leave the hotel. Well, maybe he found someone else. Maybe he's in someone else's room. Well, we've looked everywhere. I said, well, okay, let me come up to his room. I'll meet you at his room. I walk into his room, and the room doesn't exist anymore. There's an ennui that's smashed. All the, all the mirrors are gone. The lighting fixtures are off the wall. I said, oh, my God, he's having one heck of a rock and roll party. Well, we hunted around the hotel some more, and I noticed that one of the windows was open. And I said, you don't think he could be walking outside on the, on the ledge, do you? Well, well, anything's possible with Peter. Maybe he decided to walk out of the ledge. Well, sure enough, we looked outside, and nine stories up on the ledge, on the side of the hotel, Peter was out there singing and having a great time. Well, we coaxed him in and finally went to bed for the evening. One of the great moments that uh, we've had with Peter was certainly around the song Beth. And in fact, Beth turned out to be a lifesaver for us. Uh, Peter had come up with a song that everyone thought might work, and especially the producer, Bob Ezrin, who said, you know, we could use a song like this on the album. So Peter and Bob finished the song, and it turned out to be not only a major success for us, but it also helped the Destroyer album become a major album. It was the biggest single that, that the group has ever had, and uh, it was because of Peter Chris, because Peter came up with an idea and a song that initially uh, the guys really didn't want on the album. Uh, Gene and Paul thought it wasn't a Kiss song, and it wasn't, certainly wasn't a typical Kiss song. However, at uh, listening to it, I knew it had to be on the album, and uh, it certainly struck me as a possible single. And it went on the album, and it turned out to be not only the biggest success they've had as a single, but it saved and promoted the Destroyer album all over the world. Oh, there was one night at a concert when someone threw a cherry bomb on stage and it landed right beside Peter's drums. And I see Peter fall off his stand. And I'm saying, oh, my goodness. You know, and everyone's panicking. We help Peter off the stage. And, of course, the audience knew it and everything. And, and there's an ambulance that's backing up to the backstage area and Peter's being carried out. And now we're on our way to the hospital. And he looks up at me and he says, Bill, do you think we should do the rest of the show? <laughs> I said, yeah, I think so. He said, well, turn this thing around. Well, he turned it around. He comes back to the stage, and we finished the show. Uh, as always, Peter could be very, very emotional. And, uh, and during those times, it was it, between the partying and some of the drugs and everything else that were being taken, Peter would be extreme. And Gina Paul came to me and said, look, I think, I think people are going to have to replace Peter. I didn't think it was necessarily the right thing to do at that time. I had hoped that we'd give him a chance to, to help himself first, but it didn't seem to get any better, and Peter at the time was also in the middle of getting married, and it seemed to be so, so emotional that we had many, many meetings uh, between uh, the four of us, uh, Ace, Paul, Gene, and myself. Uh, Ace and I were on one side, and, and Gene and Paul were on the other side. Uh, the decision was finally made, and we had that final meeting with Peter after he came back from his honeymoon and told him what was going to happen. Uh, obviously, he was very hurt, and uh, Gene and Paul left the meeting after, after telling him, and uh, he turned around to Ace and asked Ace if that's what he felt, and Ace reluctantly said yes. And... Um, we finally left Peter alone to ponder what was happening, and uh, it was very sad, an emotional day. Looking for a new drummer. Well, it was time. We knew we had to face it. Uh, we had to find a new drummer. Peter was gone, and the trauma of settling in to find a new drummer turned out to be more, more of a chore than anyone expected. Hundreds of drummers we went through. We used to set up a, a rehearsal a rehearsal hall and had a drummer every half hour. We figured the drummer would play f for 15 or 20 minutes, we'd have to say hi, we'd have to say goodbye, we'd have to be nice to them, we'd have to shuffle them out and get the next drummer in. So we figured about a, a half hour to 40 minutes per drummer. And we went through oh, drummer after drummer after drummer, realizing that of course we couldn't use anyone that was already known because uh, if everyone already knew them, he couldn't be part of KISS, certainly not if they knew his face. 
So we kept looking for new drummers, and uh, most of them weren't up to the level that we needed. Plus, the personality was important. Don't forget, this drummer had to put up makeup every single day for the most part, had to hide his face all the time, and had to be part of a group that was already established and come in as a new member. As we went along, we found this one guy, Eric Carr. Eric was a sweetheart, uh, played very well, didn't seem to have an overpowering ego, and the guys thought they could get along with him and, and liked his drumming. So we finally signed Eric. Eric didn't become a full member of KISS. He was a hired hand, but he was a terrific person. And to, to give him a little feel of what a rock and roller was like, we bought him a new Porsche and gave him a fairly good-sized salary for joining KISS. The guys didn't really want to make another full partner with the group KISS, and he, he really remained a hired hand to the very end. We had some trouble getting ready for the first show. Uh, it was only weeks away at the Palladium in New York City. And the reason we wanted to have this show, it was only one show in the United States, uh, we were getting ready to do a European tour, but we needed some way to announce the new drummer, the name and the character to the American press to get ready for the tour in the United States. And we also needed a full dress rehearsal with audience to make sure everything was running smoothly. And that was the night at the Palladium. Before the Palladium show, there were plenty of problems to overcome. Uh, we didn't know what character Eric was going to be. Couldn't be the cat, because the cat was Peter Chris. So we had to come up with a new character and a new costume. Well, it seemed like it would be pretty easy, but effectively, after we got involved with it, it was a lot harder than we thought. Was he going to be a chicken? Was he going to be a hawk? Was he going was he going to be a chipmunk? We had no idea what he was going to be like. And as the days got closer and closer and closer, it got worse. Paul and Jean got scared about uh, what was going to happen. Was it going to happen? Were we going to finish it? Where did we have the costume? Is the makeup going to work? And I remember at the last minute, the day before the show, where we were rehearsing the songs and trying to finish up everything, Jean and Paul and I had our first real argument upstairs in the dressing room at the Palladium, uh, them s stating very clearly to me that I was the manager, I'd better get it together and make sure that he was ready for tomorrow night's show, or that was it, and they just stormed out of the dressing room. Well, Eric and I spent most of the night uh, getting ready for this, finishing up a costume that wasn't quite done yet, deciding what the final touches of the makeup was and what he was going to be, and getting ready for the next day. Literally stayed up all night working on this, and by the next day, it was done. He was the fox, we had the outfit, and he was ready to go, and the makeup was set. Uh, the next day, it turned out to be a little exasperating, only because, of course, it was the first time in the announcement of the new drummer, as well as the only show we were playing for all the press and the key KISS fans in the United States before we went to Europe. The show turned out spectacularly well. Eric did a great job, and we were on our way to Europe. A couple of interesting stories that happened on that European tour. Uh, one happened in Milan, Italy. There was a communist de demonstration that were going through the streets of Milan when we arrived, and there was plenty of talk about it, both in the papers and on television and around the hotels. And we were going to the soccer stadium where we were playing the first show. And the crowds had started to come in and mill around, and, and we had already set up the stage and everything else. And all of a sudden, the group was, was walking back and forth, and they heard a fight had broken out. Well, they were behind the stage, and they could hear the people starting to scuffle, then swear, and then the fight would break out, and the bottles would be thrown and everything else. Well, they thought there was going to be a full-scale riot. They ran back down through the tunnel in the middle of the stadium and back to the dressing room. So I, I stayed out there to see what was going to happen, knowing that we pretty much had enough crew to take care of it. And then I walked down through the tunnel under the ground and wound up at the dressing room. When I got to the dressing room, the door was barricaded. And I had to tell him many times it was really Bill. I'm the manager, remember me? <laughs> Knocked on the door until they finally unbarricaded the door and let me in. Well, many discussions unfolded then. One was we're not going to play. Two was we're not leaving the dressing room. How are we going to get out of here alive? And so forth. And my only comeback on that was that I thought we had more firepower than anyone in the audience.